Sadhguru Jagi Vasudev is a realized master, mystic, and yogi. He has shown the way for people to attain to their natural joy and to live life with experience from one's own inner nature. His presence is filled with grace and compassion. Sadhguru's scientific approach towards spirituality and work towards the upliftment of humanity have received accolades worldwide. The words that come from him in intensity and utmost clarity, from his deep understanding and wisdom, can change the very core of the being. Belonging to no particular tradition, Sadhguru incorporates what is most valid for the modern person from the spiritual sciences. His work, an outpouring of his blissfulness, finds expression in the form of a ceaseless offering to help all beings. Available to all who are willing, Sadhguru's life is an invitation to the divine through individual transformation. Welcome to the silent revolution of self-realization. In every culture, anything beyond the normal perception of life, anything beyond the normal day-to-day -day happenings means it's uh, an opportunity to ask and receive things which are not normally available to people. The Santa Claus of the West who is bag full of gifts, or the traditional three boons of India, whenever God appears, He offers you three boons, you can ask Him what you want. <clears throat> this interpretation or this direction of lore and stories that have why this Lord has taken in this direction is always <clears throat> in the world, a large population of the world is always deprived. Always it's been so. A large population in the world is always deprived of many things that they would aspire to have. Or I would say almost everybody is deprived of what they want to have. <laughs> if they have this, they don't have that, if they have that, they don't have this. So, almost everyone is deprived of something or the other. So, if a new possibility arises, the first thing is to ask. And if anybody is of any worth, he is supposed to give. I know there are various people there are various prayers and lamentations of the so-called devotees where uh, they are swearing by the God and saying, if you cannot even give this, what kind of a God are you? <laughs> if you cannot even do this, what kind of a guru are you? Where is your compassion? <laughs> In the Shaiva lore, Shiva, narrates many stories and incidents to highlight the limitation, to highlight the trouble that one can get into just by giving indiscriminately. The trouble that both the giver and the receiver can get into by simply giving somebody something that… for which they are not a dare. 
if they had evolved their life to a point to that which they are desiring, it would anyway happen. But before they reach there, they want to have it. Before you evolve yourself to a point where you're ready to receive something, if you receive something, the great gift may become a great curse. There are any number of people on the planet who manage to somehow manipulate situations to get something that they want and suffer immensely because of what they received. They would be better off with the desire, but by fulfilling the desire they get into deep trouble. So both the giver and the receiver can be in lot of trouble simply by giving something or by receiving something for which they are not ready. Many times human beings, once they attain to a certain level of attainment, they have an urge to be overly compassionate. Misplaced compassion always comes from your ego. You want to be the most compassionate person on the planet. Wherever anybody needs anything, reach out. This is not coming from any kind of understanding or wisdom or awareness. This is coming from wanting to be the best or the most. You know, whatever you do, you want to be the most. <laughs> Wherever you go, even if people say, I am stupid, people want to say, I am the most stupid person in the world, even there they want to start, stand first. Somehow they want to be the best, one way or the other. I want to be the most intelligent or I want to be the most stupid, I don't want to be lost in between. I don't want to be ordinary, I want to be somehow special. So you want to be the most compassionate, this problem is there among people. They want to be the most compassionate. True compassion is not about giving or taking. True compassion is just doing what's needed. You have no preferences of your own. Simply doing what's needed is compassion. You revving yourself up into a huge amount of emotion and reaching out to somebody is not compassion. This is just self-satisfaction, devious ways to fulfill yourself. Compassion is possible. Genuine compassion is possible. When there is nothing to fulfill in you, you're just doing what's needed. But always, if you get into your deep emotion and do something, you think that was a very compassionate moment. No, you are seeking self-fulfillment. I am not saying anything right or wrong, it is still coming from a certain inadequacy. So an overly compassionate sage who was indiscriminately disposing of people's needs because of his austerities, he had attained to a certain capability and he was giving it away. So one day Shiva called him and tried to advise him. See, this is not good. The way you are dispensing gifts and boons to other people, this will not bring well-being to you or to the people whom you give. It may bring you much trouble, it may bring him much trouble or both of you much trouble. So. Stop giving these boons. People come and ask, it's okay, you don't have to give. Parvati, Shiva's wife who was sitting there, she said, Oh my Lord, how is this possible? As it is, there are very few givers in the world. As it is, there are very few people who are willing to give anything in the world. And a few men who are giving, you are trying to restrain them also, what is the point? 
at least a few men who are willing to give, let them give. You must explain this to me. This is not fair. There are very few givers. That also you want to discount and make it much smaller. Then Shiva said, see, this is not about depriving people of something. This is not about depriving the world of receiving something. Nor is it an effort to deprive the person to have the pleasure of giving something. It is just that instead of helping people to evolve where they will naturally receive the bounty of life, an unevolved person, if you give something, you will only overburden him, you will only destroy his life. You, if you are concerned about somebody's ultimate well-being, you must put him through the painstaking process of evolving him to a higher possibility where he will receive higher dimensions of life, where receiving just happens to him because he deserves it. If you gift a ton of gold to an ant, it will only crush the ant. It will not make the ant rich, it will only crush the ant. So what you give, how you give is very important. You don't just give because somebody is asking. Let me tell you a story. Once there was a very sweet sage, <laughs> sweet one, not like me. <laughs> and he sat in his cave in the mountain and was in… into very stringent austerities, eating simple food, always focused on his sadhana. One day a king came hunting in the forest, then he found this cave, came inside and saw the sage totally absorbed in his meditation. He bowed down to him and uh, he was thirsty, he wanted to drink water. He looked around, there he found a real mean looking uh, vessel, all… you know, a real mean looking vessel, we don't have such a thing in the ashram. We dispose of the mean looking ones, whether they're vessels or people or whatever <laughs> The king thought, such a wonderful human being, so deep in his meditation, so dedicated, why should he use such a mean-looking vessel? So he rode back, then he sent some of his men and said, leave two most wonderful golden urns for him to use, two golden vessels. So the, his king's people came, took away this mean-looking vehicle, vessel and put up this golden vessels. And after a few days, the sage opened his eyes and to perform his morning ablutions and also for other purposes, he looked for his vessel, it was not there. Because he could not find it anywhere, then he found these two golden vessels it was not very convenient, they were too elaborate, ornate and heavy, but he decided to use it because there was nothing else. Life went on for a few days. One day, a very mean looking person with a mean… very mean mind with mean intentions came in the direction. He walked into the cave and the first thing his eyes fell on the golden vessels. Then the sage welcomed this man, served him a small meal that he had. The man ate but his eyes were fixed on the golden vessel. The moment the sage closed his eyes to meditate, the man picked up the golden vessel and ran. When he ran, the sage saw in his meditation this man running away just with a one golden vessel. Then the sage ran behind him. 
Both of them ran. The man saw the sage coming and ran faster and faster. But because of all this yoga, you know, the sage could run faster. By the time the thief reached the town, the sage caught up with him. Then that man, he was too tired to do anything else. He placed the golden vessel at the sage's feet and said, Forgive me. People gathered around them. And the sage said, No, 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 I had one more. You just forgot to take the other one. I just came here to give you the other one. And the man didn't know what to do. And the people who looked at this whole scene really humiliated the man because he stole from such a man who is running behind him to give him the other vessel that he missed out. The sage went back. He went back and he started looking for his old vessel. He searched the whole cave everywhere, here, there. In the process of turning everything around, he pulled out a few baby mice who were there. And also the mother mice, the when he pulled, turned everything around, these baby mice fell out, the mother mouse, terrified, ran away, abandoning the children. So, the sage ended up with five little mice. The mother was terrified, never came back. So he started feeding these baby mice with little grain that he had and they were slowly putting on weight. One day, a cat walked in and mopped up four of them. The fifth one, the willy one, went and hid in a corner and escaped. But four of them, the cat mopped it up. Then this one mice, he was feeding it and making it grow. Then one day the cat came. He chased away the cat. The mouse was so terrified. So the sage, out of his compassion, thought, how long can I protect this mouse? Every time the cat comes, I'll have to open my eyes, I have to come out of my meditation. This won't work. Out of his siddhi, out of his capabilities, out of his sadhana that he has done, he decided to turn this mouse into a fierce cat. So the mouse became a cat. So the other stars, cat stopped coming because here there is a fierce cat. After some time, a wild dog came looking for the cat. Then he chased away the wild dog, but the wild dog hung around, waiting for an opportunity to get the cat. Then he thought, this doesn't work and again he used his powers, turned the cat into a dog. Then the dog was fine for some time and the dog likes to roam around. One day he came running into the cave with a tail in between his legs. When the sage saw a panther was chasing the dog, he stopped the panther, chased away the panther. Then he sat there and thought, this is getting too troublesome. Every time I close my eyes, either I have to protect a mouse or a cat or a dog or something. So he decided the best thing is to turn this into a lion. He'll be the king of the jungle. Then I can turn him loose in the forest, he will be safe. I will have no problems. So he turned this dog into a big lion. Now the lion roamed about the forest. When he walked, every other animal ran away seeing the lion. But though this was the body of a lion, it still had the heart of a mouse. He was feeling very diffident. If they come to know that I am just a mouse, what will they do to me? He was always going through the struggle. You know, many people are going through this. They are <laughs> In the society, in the world, they are like lions, but inside they are like mice, they are constantly struggling within themselves, always. Whenever a person <clears throat> is 
he is placed in a situation which is beyond his writ or want, then that person will suffer so much insecurity and fear. Because of this fear, in his mind so many evil thoughts will arise. This happens every other day in the world, all the time it's happening, it happens here also in the ashram. If you give somebody which is beyond their want, if you give somebody which is beyond their capabilities, if you give somebody beyond what they deserve, suddenly they become so mean-minded because somewhere inside they are small, they have to put on the big act. Now they will start thinking all kinds of nonsense. So this lion was feeling very insecure. He is a lion as far as the world is concerned. Everybody is afraid of him, but within himself he is a mouse. Then he thought, the only other person who knows that I am a mouse is the sage. If I finish him off, nobody will know that I am a mouse, I will be a real lion. With this intention, he walked into the cave. The sage was sitting and meditating. The lion slowly approached him because if she… the lion finishes off the sage, nobody in the world will know that this is a mouse. As he came closer, the sage realized. Then he looked at the lion and said, this was not right of me to turn a mouse into a lion and he turned the lion back into your mouse and said, get out of here, fend for your own life. It is nature for a cat to eat a mouse, for a dog to eat a cat, for a bigger animal to eat the dog. It is natural unless they evolve to that position. If you give them that position, they will only suffer and they will bring suffering upon everybody. So Shiva went on with this story and he went further, I will stop here <laughs> Now, this traditional, what to say, temptation that they have created in people. If you ever see a holy person, if you ever see a sage or a saint, first thing is ask for what you want, it will happen. I am telling you, never ask because if he is wise, he will not give. But sometimes he is just in a state where he says, okay. If he says, okay, you are in trouble because you will get something that you are not ready for. If you get things that you are not ready for, life doesn't become better. Life only becomes turmoil in so many ways. So when you sit in a certain space, when you sit in a certain energy, if you notice a certain person or a place is creating a certain level of energy, it seems to be a little bigger possibility than what you are. That is a time when you don't think of anything, when you don't ask for anything, you simply sit. If you simply sit, you will get, it, get the necessary nutrient to evolve very fast, to mutate from one dimension to another. Once you grow into a certain possibility, everything that is possible in that dimension will anyway happen to you. If you do not grow into that possibility but just aspire for that, then you are just bringing heaps of trouble upon yourself. So meditation, temple, dhyana linga or sitting with a guru is not a time to ask. It is a time to imbibe and allow this one to evolve into a higher possibility so that if it evolves, what has to happen to it will anyway happen. Sadhguru, I feel uh, that there's a very fine line between being trustful and being naive. Um, <laughs> how can I uh, manage this? Which one are you? 
Right now, <clears throat> you know, a month ago I was in Hyderabad. After I spoke in one of the meetings, the local, local newspaper next day reported, Sadhguru denies God. Headlines, <laughs> they put. <laughs> the heading of the article was, Sadhguru denies God or something like this. And it went on to describe how I deny God. Why this thing is happening is simply because instead of, instead of using your naivite, I am constantly trying to help you to be doubtful about everything. Because I am telling people, anyway you have a doubt about everything, you don't trust anybody in your life, please see this. You don't really trust anybody in your life. Even people with whom you have lived for ten years, twenty years, if they do one act, that you cannot understand, immediately all kinds of suspicion will arise about them, isn't it? Yes or no? If they do just one thing that you cannot understand, any number of suspicions will come in your mind. A guru is always a suspect. <laughs> so naturally there are more suspicions about him than anybody else. Unfortunately, that's the reality. That is why the possibility which is so close is so far away. <laughs> so I'm not asking you to be trustful, I'm always asking you to doubt. Doubt is fine with me, but suspicion is a sickness. Doubt means you're looking as to what is the truth. Suspicion means you made a conclusion about it. Doubt means you don't know, you're looking. That is a good state to be, you're looking constantly. Naive means you're suspicious and constantly wondering, is the other person much smarter than me? and still taking me for a ride in spite of all my suspicions, these people think they are naive, they are actually suspicious. But they are constantly wondering that the other person may be so much smarter than them and still taking them for a ride. Isn't it so? There is no really naive person in the world. They are suspicious people who are dumb. <laughs> Dumb and suspicious. Suspicion is not intelligence. In fact, the lower the level of your intelligence, more suspicious you are in your nature. Somebody who is intelligent naturally trusts people around him, at least in the day-to-day -day affairs. People who have a small mind are suspicious about everybody around them. Have you noticed this? The less intelligent they are, the more suspicious they are always. Because they can't see, figure out one thing from the other, they're constantly afraid that somebody will misuse them. They're constantly fear that somebody is going to take them for a ride. So they will be very suspicious, but they're clueless. So they call themselves naive. They're not naive, they're suspicious, but with the brains of a caterpillar. <laughs> now, how do… the question is, 
How do I know whether I am being taken for a ride or not? Let's come directly to it <laughs> isn't it? That's a question, isn't it? <clears throat> Let me tell you, you are being taken for a ride <laughs> because You are still not yet in that stage where I can either expose or impose or even tell you what it is about. It is like, I don't know if you have seen but you come from a Asian family, you might have seen, in India especially, Mothers have a whole technology as to how to stuff the child with more food than you would normally eat, you know <laughs> You know this <laughs> technology? <laughs> now, <laughs> they will take so much rice and whatever in the plate. The child says, no, this is too much, I am not going to eat that. So, okay, you eat one half of it. This half, as the child begins to eat, they'll mix everything together again. Let's say the child is eaten half of this half, then they'll mix this thing together and then again make it… child says, no, it's too much, so again make it half. Okay, okay, only half I'll give you, again make it half. Like this they will go on doing and in the end, showing kakama, guvama, Chanda Mama, this one, that one, you know, all kinds of distractions. And unknowingly the child will eat up the whole plate full of rice. Definitely the mother is taking the child for a ride, isn't it? Yes? Similarly, the guru is also constantly taking his disciples or devotees for a ride because if you really tell them what they are supposed to swallow, they will just say this is impossible and they will run away. So because you like everything in installments, <laughs> I am taking you for a ride in installments, but it will never happen in installments. It is whole or nothing. But your willingness comes in installments. Do you see, the first day you arrived at the introductory, what level of willingness you were and today what level of willingness you are, slowly we have taken you for a ride, isn't it? Making you little more willing, little more willing, little more willing. The way I am talking to you today, if I had spoken to you on that day, you would have left, never to see my face again. Isn't it so? So we are taking you for a ride. <laughs> Sadhguru, what is personality? How does one develop it? If you look at what you call as a human being, it's a certain amount of life energy manifested within a certain form. As there is a physical form, there is also an energy form to complement that. But that also is a structured form. The more and more one develops his personality, personality means the more and more you identify yourself with certain limited quali qualities in life, you become a strong personality. You have very strong sense of what is right and wrong, you have very strong sense of what you like and dislike, all these things establish your personality. This makes you rigid. With this rigidity, in the physical spheres of life, you can push your way through because you have a strong personality. All the time, today especially, if you 
are planning to become something in the world, let's say you want to become an executive, you want to be run a corporate whatever or you want to start your own business, people are telling you, you must believe in yourself. You must tell yourself, I'm great, I can do it, kind of things. You're trying to establish your personality so that you can push your way through in the world. Some kind of physical success in the world, some kind of success which is socially relevant could be achieved by having a strong personality. Now, when we say a spiritual process, we are trying to dissolve this personality because the stronger your personality, the more rigid your energies become. The more rigid your energies are, less the possibility of you transcending into higher dimensions of life because you are sort of concretized yourself with your likes and dislikes, opinions, ideas, philosophies, whatever. So a spiritual process means we are trying to dissolve all that you created. First of all, to understand why we are trying to dissolve this is, why did you construct something? Sim simply because somewhere you never tasted the basis of who this is. You never experienced this one, so you are trying to build a false entity which will somehow survive. Somewhere you felt so inadequate as a being that you are trying to become some kind of a person with some strength. Because you never tasted the strength of this being, now you are trying to taste the false strength of your personality. Because there is such a deep insecurity of being not worthwhile, you are trying to make yourself worthwhile by building a personality. And these personalities, what kind of personality you build, is subject to so many inputs that you take in your life, is subject to what you are exposed to, your culture, your religion, your family, your education. All these things are playing a role in building your personality. As I said, it's socially relevant, it has no life relevance. Your personality cannot go anywhere. It can go to the office, it can go home, it can go on the street, but it has no place to turn inward. It cannot touch any other dimension of your life. It is only a tool to push your way through in the world. When you say, I'm turning spiritual, now you have a longing to taste, experience and ma establish yourself in other dimensions of life. If that has to happen, you need a presence, you need connection with life not with the false structures that you have built. So all sadhana is towards that. So when a, as a person becomes a spiritual possibility, that means he has become more malleable, he is not rigid, he is no more a burnt pot. If we look at you like a pot, he is no more a burnt earthen pot, he is just formed himself because he also has to still live in the society. But this is a mud pot which is just clay, any time you could melt it and let what is inside burst forth. He has not burnt his clay, he has kept it raw. Any moment he want, if you just… if he just dips himself into the water, he will be gone. You, you make a pot out of the earth, if you don't burn it, if you just dip into the water two minutes and try to take it out, nothing will come with you, it's all gone. But if you burn it, if you keep it there for ten years, still it won't go, it is right there. So what you are doing in terms of building a personality is, the form that is necessary to survive in this existence 
you are concretizing it. Spirituality means you are deconcretizing it so that it is malleable. You still maintain a form, you still play around with a personality, but uh, it is not you. Any moment you want, you can just drop it. Now you can enjoy your person also, but above all you enjoy your presence. Less personality you carry, more presence you have. More personality you carry, very little presence you have. So, all sadhana is towards this, to dissolve the personality and enhance the presence of life in you. Sadhguru, what is desire? Buddha says we must give up all desire. How to do it? Do you want to know the answer? Do you want to know the answer? Yes? Do you have a desire for it or no? Do you have a desire to know this answer or no? Yes. So the very basis of everything that you are is desire, isn't it? If somebody says, give it up, just because somebody says, give it up, can you give it up? All you will land up with is, you will have a huge desire to give up all desires. I don't want to have any desires. Is that also a desire? Yes or no? Is that also a desire? So tell me, what will you do without a desire? Your very existence is desire, isn't it? Yes. This heart is beating, this breath is happening, the body is functioning, every cell in the body is pulsating right now because there is an enormous amount of desire in everything. Otherwise, it cannot exist. So what you call as life and what you call as desire is not different. If you drop your desire, you will drop your life. Are you ready? <laughs> no. No. So you have a desire to live, obviously <laughs> So don't take up philosophies which are against the very basis of your life by misunderstanding somebody who lived here two thousand five hundred years ago. You did not listen to Buddha. You read all those books that stupid scholars wrote about him. Two thousand five hundred years later, see already what was said just a month ago in the class, it has changed color in your utterance. Two thousand five hundred years later, if you talk about me, you know how you'll interpret me? So many distortions will happen, isn't it? So, Gautama could not have said something so stupid as drop your desires. He's an intelligent man, obviously. He knew his way to the beyond. He taught the way to the beyond to thousands of people. So he cannot say such a stupid thing as drop your desire because wanting to drop my desire itself is desire, isn't it? He won't say such things. Let us not dig up his grave and make him roll around. It's not necessary. Too much misinterpretations have happened to all the Buddhas, the Krishnas, the Ramas, the Jesuses. Too much misinterpretation has happened. That's why I'm saying, don't bother about those people. You don't have to bother about them because they lived wonderfully. You only have to do karmas to those people who lived badly, isn't it? Yes? <laughs> like your father or grandfather, you have to perform karmas to slowly push them to heaven because they must have lived badly. You don't have to do any karma to Gautam Buddha or Krishna or somebody else because they know their way. They know their way here, they know their way beyond. You don't have to do anything to them, so leave them alone. If they have inspired you to come here, their job is done. They cannot do anything more now. <laughs> if their stories have inspired you to seek a spiritual process, 
that is good, nothing beyond that they can do. So let us not interpret them or misinterpret them now. You look at it from your own intelligence. If you look at it from your own intelligence, can you see that no desire, no life, yes or no? Yes. So let's proceed from there. Now, all the desires that you desire, will they be fulfilled? Cannot be. So many of them will naturally be unfulfilled. So desire is not the source of misery, unfulfilled desire is the source of misery. Desire, when it's fulfilled, it's a source of joy, isn't it so? The only joy that you know is fulfilling desires, is that so? The only joy that you know in your life is fulfilling desires, isn't it? And the only misery that you know is unfulfilled desires. So, what you call as desire seems to be falling both ways. The source of your joy is desire, the source of your misery is desire. I am telling you, the source of your very life is desire. So you cannot destroy the desire and have a wonderful life. You are my perfect mirror, you show me what I'm not In the endless pit of what once was me Layer and layer you peel off me The pain it is but the joy Showing me what I'm not, for showing me what I could be.